Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. Today, I'm going to talk about securing modern apps with uh, zero trust and next generation web application firewall. Uh, I'm so happy to be here in this conference. Um, I came with my entire family, so that's cool that, that the conference allows you to, to come with your family and, and your children and, and have childcare support. So, appreciate that. Uh, before we start with the topic, let me introduce myself. Um, I am uh, Jose Carlos Chavez. I am a software engineer at the Trade. The Trade is a service mesh company. Uh, we do security features uh, on top of uh, Istio service mesh. Um, I am an open source enthusiast. I have been doing open source for seven years now. I really enjoyed it. Um, I am a, a WASP, Corasa WAF. Uh, co-leader. Um, this is a WAF project at OWASP. Um, I'm a Zipkin core member for those who who are in the world of distributed tracing or observability. And I'm also a loving father. Uh, and I'm from Peru. So, web application firewalls. Uh, WAF for family and friends. Um, what is a WAF? Well, traditionally, it, a WAF helps you to protect web applications from incoming traffic uh, from, from the internet. Um, it protects you from known attacks like cross-site scripts, uh, cross-site forgery, SQL injection, this kind of malicious traffic that aim to, to compromise your systems. Um, usually, it's deployed in the layer 7 as a reverse proxy in front of your, your servers, uh, listening and monitoring all the traffic and deciding whether this is a malicious request or not. And, and the, the proxy basically does the analysis and then uh, decides whether this request goes upstream or not, right? This is how you traditionally deploy a WAF. There is the outside world with web app, uh, mobile applications, web browsers, devices, uh, legit, uh, legit, legitimate um, users, and then attackers as well. They go through a firewall in front of all your servers. Um, and, and then if you see it, some sort of becomes a, as a bottleneck in, in, in the middle. So evaluation can be that expensive, it, that it, it cannot be that expensive. Also, as you see, uh, you have it decoupled from the server, so any knowledge about the server is an overhead. But yeah, in the old days, uh, you have the WAF like this, as every other firewall. Some of the features are IP fencing, which is uh, you can deny a specific IPs through a deny list, uh, or allow specific IPs. Um, you can do geofencing and geoblocking based on GeoIP databases. Basically, you can create a virtual perimeter and say, okay, requests from this region or this country can go through, requests from this region or this country are denied, uh, depending on the GeoIP database, right? Uh, another quite useful but complicated feature is request response inspection. Basically, the WAF will um, buffer your headers and your body and the query strings, run analysis and examine them and compare against no malicious strings and then decide whether this is a legitimate request or not. Uh, it's useful because it al uh, allows you to prevent zero days attacks. If, if you remember Log4Shell, for example, which was an attack through a query string parameter, well, WAF could, be, could prevent these kind of attacks when you know what the problem is or, or how the attacker is approaching your service, but you don't have the solution yet in place. Uh, it avoids client-side attacks, of course, bot attacks, virus files, etc. Then you have a security rules, which is a curated list of uh, rules that will block known attacks like SQL injection, cross-site uh, scripting attacks, local and remote file inclusion, uh, remote execution, common injection, size restriction, this kind of rule sets. Uh, if you have heard about, for example, a WASP core rule set, it's a curated list of all these rules for preventing this kind of attacks. 
and, and they can be deployed in a WAF. Anomaly scoring is another interesting feature where uh, you will analyze the, the, the traffic and then if a rule matches, uh, depending on a misspelling, for example, in the URL, maybe some in, someone trying to attack your server, or if they're actually trying to run an SQL injection, um, you will give an score and then based on the threshold, you will decide whether I should block this request or not, right? It's a well-known feature where you will block a request or you will only allow a certain number of requests in a window uh, of time, right? Um, I, I guess the most, uh, let's say, the most use, use uh, the most famous use case is blocking by IP, but you could pretty much do on every other input, right? It could be user agent, it could be IP, it could be, um, yeah, well, th those, are, those are typical use cases. And then you have both mitigation, which is basically analyzing the cookie sent by the browser and then check them to find whether they are legitimate bots or not, right? Because there are, there are different kind of attacks. When you have a bot, then you launch a captcha challenge or you can have a bot pretender, which is a bot that pretends to be a good bot, like the, the, those, index, those bots that index your web and, and, and web scrapping protection and so on. Right. Those are the features that are from the from the classical WAF, let's say. And I know security has become a, like a strong uh, concern these years, but uh, before it wasn't that hard. Security was easier. Everything was easier, I guess. But security specifically was an afterthought. Uh, there was a time when security was just about, I need more security, so I just deploy a new WAF, and then I feel protected, right? Unfortunately, now the, the, the way we deploy applications and the way we operate applications and the amount of dependencies we are tied on when we build an application are so big that this is not anymore valid. And the reason is because the traditional WAF was focused on perimeter security, right? Basically, um, you were, when, when you were inside the network, inside the perimeter, of security, then you were safe, right? You will even have uh, unencrypted traffic because, yeah, they are deployed in your in your servers, right? So why would you not trust them? Um, and the problem at the moment is that uh, with the, with all this cloud native madness that we live on, and and, and because of the scalability, uh, the scalability needs that we have now, and the way we deploy stuff. Um, if you think about a deployment nowadays, it's not something that you could draw a perimeter around, right? Because there is no single and easily identifiable perimeter. Because you have now cloud, multi-cloud, on-prem, third-party services, lambdas or function as a services, artifact registries, etc. So where would you draw the line whether this is trustable or not based on a perimeter, right? Also now, in the time of microservices, a, a request traverses dozens of services when you do a, when you do a curl, for example. So uh, the majority of the traffic is east-west, right, across fellow workloads, whereas traditional WAF and perimeter security is more like a single gateway and you receive all the traffic from the internet to the internals. Um, so yeah, that, that's problematic. The, the, let's say the more of the traffic happens inside your network, not from the outside. And then what I was uh, mentioning before, like you have gateways in front of your services and they have to have a lot of knowledge about internals because they have to protect the PHP applications, the Go applications, the Java applications, deploying tons of rules for different languages and uh, having to know a lot about the implementation details of your, of your components, right? So that leads to operational complexity, misconfigurations, uh, and, and you need to, to have an effective way to deploy all these configurations in a timely manner and all that, right? So it becomes much more complicated. If you read security reports from the last year, one of the biggest source of uh, vulnerabilities in the systems are misconfigurations. So. We should be avoiding this. And then finally, the guiding principle of perimeter security is trust but verify, right? But uh, that means that you will first trust and then verify when the attacker is already inside, right? And, and, and this is basically crazy now because uh, the attacker is most of the times inside already, right? 
Then is when zero trust arises, right? Started by NIST, uh, zero trust is enable, enabling the right user under the right conditions to guide the right permissions to the right data, right? Zero trust is now very popular. Everyone talks about zero trust. Everybody sells zero trust. You might buy lots of zero trusts. Uh, so let's get, let's give one a step back because you probably heard about a lot of tooling about zero trust frameworks um, and services, blah blah. Uh, but let's give one a step back and think about of the definition. Is the term for an evolving set of cybersecurity paradigms? paradigms that move defenses from static network-based perimeters to focus on users, assets, and resources, right? Basically, every actor in, your, in, your, in the communication in, internal of your, of your deployment becomes a first-class citizen, right? This is the definition from the original paper, Serial Trust Architecture from NIST. And what are the driver assumptions? Like, what, what is the shift in the mindset? that turn into this kind of approach. Well, trust can no longer be based on a network perimeter, as perimeters can be always be breached and will be breached for sure. Uh, policies have to be defined based on the assumption that the attacker is already inside of the network, right? As opposite as what we saw in perimetral security where we first trust and then verify, right? Here we are more like in a paranoid uh, mode where we always not trust anyone. Uh, all access decisions have to rely on least privilege, per request, and context-based principle, right? And no, and on identities associated with users, services, and devices, right? You have now user accounts, service accounts, um, so all the actors participating in your model, in a, in a request response model or, or whatever, are first class actors. They should be identifiable, they should be, they, they, we should run security assessment on, on all of them. And, and we should be able to know which one is and what permissions they have, right? It's not anymore like, okay, I'm logged in or logged out, right? Which was back in the days. And security and access state constantly change over time, right? Um, it's not, so this is, this is a shift in how you see your system in terms of security, where before you have an assessment of security and, and uh, it was a static now, is more like over the time when must my services is not secure, right? When my deployment is not secure because uh, from one minute to the other, a new CVE could be um, disclosed and then your, your system is not secure anymore. But nothing changed, right? Your system is the same as one minute before, but then the state has changed it because of external conditions, because of the internals of your system, right? So if you were granted permissions yesterday, that doesn't mean that you will grant permissions today, even with the same payload, with the same request, the same services, the same actors, right? These are the driver assumptions. Then we have the tenets. Um, first, well, tenets are principles, but uh, not in a dogmatic way, more like in a consensus of a group of, of people. Um, all data sources on computer services are considered resources. As I said, like, before you had, like, uh, your deployments were basically a rise, an, an array or an arrangement of servers and endpoints. But now you have uh, more dynamic elements. You have scaling groups, you have um, lambdas, function as a services, things that uh, in a non-deterministic way will be deployed in your system at some point, doing something. But not necessarily you have control of them uh, in terms of security because they will, they will have to get access to your components still, right? They might have a specific permissions to your, to your resources in your environment. Second, communications are secure regardless of location. This is the first shift from, or, or the main shift from perimetral security, right? Um, you have access policy, which are by default to deny, and then you have, grant, you have to grant a specific access, like you, questions like, why am I accepting this request from, from, from this other service? Although they are in the same cluster, should I trust them or not? Um, so this service in the other, for, in, when you have a tenancy model, for example, is this service deployed for this tenant? Should I accept requests from? Should I grant permissions from? Right, these kind of things are, are new questions that you should ask yourself and then define the least privilege based on that. Then access to individual resources is granted on a per session basis, right? Permissions shouldn't be extended um, beyond a session, right? This is what we were talking uh, earlier about 
okay, uh, the fact that you had permissions now doesn't mean that you have the same permissions or you will grant the same access in five minutes because security might change over the time. Because even though the date is the same, the input is the same, context might have changed, right? Policies might have changed, deployment might have changed. So all these things uh, should be considered. Access to resources is determined by dynamic policies and other behavioral and environmental attributes. That's what we were talking about. Like access policies now should consider a lot of non-known or unknown uh, attributes that come into play. You, you cannot anymore define a single model with these are the fields or these are the attributes that I should consider. Like now they, there will be a lot of attributes that you might not know on beforehand that will be part of your network at some point. So um, all these policies should, should be, uh, let's say, elastic enough or, or flexible enough to accept these kind of new attributes at, at some point. Monitor and measure integrity and security posture of owned and associated assets, right? This is very important because um, we say that you should learn from your errors. Well, you should learn from your logs as well, right? When you have uh, audit logs about access or denials of, uh, of, denials of access in, in certain endpoints, um, you should be paying attention on what happened, what triggered that denial or what triggered that access or what triggered that error that uh, made your service uh, uh, behave differently. And then, based on those uh, those information, to be able to uh, provide new policies that will cover these potential risks, right? Um, so you should be constantly uh, recording logs and then auditing them, monitoring changes, um, and then you will be able to learn from that to create new policies to to improve the security assessment in your serve, in your system. Um, dynamic resource authentication and authorization is strictly enforced before access allowed. Yeah, this is a, a, I would say, a key principle or a key point in zero trust that every access should be audited by a, a policy enforcement point. Actually, in the next slide, we will see the diagram where you have a policy enforcement point in front of every service that is analyzing whether can you access this, can you access this, right? And that will connect to a policy uh, decision point which holds all the knowledge and all the information about um, the acts, uh, which, which component has access to watch or what are the policies, right? Uh, granting access and trust is occurring in a dynamic and ongoing fashion, right? So you should be uh, able to uh, analyze on every time. You cannot, let's say access decision can, can be cached, but uh, shouldn't be cash or should be cash with a, with certain under certain conditions with certain policies but you cannot just say like again if i grant you access before i will grant you access now and collect info on, your, on current state of asset network infrastructure and communications to improve security posture right this is more or less what we were talking also before that like you should be monitoring everything uh, in terms of security what are the the error rates, what are the, the, the um, let's say, the, the anomaly scores that you collected, what are the, the things that changed in your system that you should be aware of and you should be analyzing to determine, is this something, let's say, suspicious? Is this something malicious? Should I take an action? Should I create a new policy? Right? This is what I was talking about, the diagram. Um, in which specifically Zero Trust talks about, about a policy decision point and a policy enforcement point that are those that are guaranteeing that your resources are protected. There is a, here it says untrusted zone, implicit trust zone, but implicit trust zone is very local. Like it's basically the workload, right? Because you, you're not trusting anyone inside. If you think about Kubernetes, for example, inside the pod, uh, the sidecar and the actual uh, container and maybe another sidecar, they trust each other because they are part of a, a logical unit of work, although they are three separate applications. But that's, that's the implicit trust zone. Outside the pod, uh, a pod from another namespace or whatsoever, that's untrusted zone, right? So then, why if Zero Trust crashes all these perimeter security, are, we are still talking about WAF, right? Because we said already that it doesn't work, that we should throw away everything around security in the perimeter. Well, in life, I like to say that less is more, 
That's my mantra. Insecurity, less is less and more is more, right? The less you have insecurity, the less protected you are. The more you have insecurity, the more you're protected are. That doesn't mean that you won't get caught, but uh, like you have most ch more chances to be protected. So web application firewall is a still a valid thing in, in the zero trust days. And pretty much other uh, security measures like VPN or, or other kind of firewalls. Um, perimeter security is still a thing, right? Uh, zero trust is not uh, incompatible or the enemy of perimeter security or network security. They are complementary. They are just different layers. So if we look at the, for example, the, the tenants that I just mentioned, there are two that are specifically fit in the WAF, uh, in the WAF law world, right? You have the integrity and security posture. Every resource request should trigger a security posture evaluation. That's what a WAF does. Every time there is an incoming request, I will analyze the header, the body, the URI, and then decide whether this request is legitimate or is malicious. When identify an attack, apply network patches and vulnerability remediation. That's also important because uh, once you detect that you are in, in uh, a vulnerability has been exploited, based on different factors, right? Based on that your services are now throwing lots of 500 or based on that there is now traffic from one service that wasn't there before, right? Suddenly one service started reaching another or because you have things like Falcon and then you see a lot of cores from one service to the internet, right? Then you put in places or put in place um, new policies that will block that. First you will probably recreate a service, kill that service, or even kill that machine because it's compromised already, uh, and then put policies in place to mitigate that problem, right? Um, sometimes you even not fight the root cause, but fight the symptoms, right? Start blocking access rather than, uh, until you can figure out how this guy got into, the, into my system. And then collect the info on current state of communications, right? You, you should be doing continuous monitoring from the audit logs uh, and traffic and then improve the security posture by rate limiting is one, one uh, option or put new policies, put new security rules that will block this uh, malicious traffic. So web application firewall is still fitting here in zero trust days and, and, and then indeed there is an opportunity. So how a zero trust web application firewall would look like, right? Well, first it should protect workloads by filtering and monitoring traffic between, uh, within workloads at uh, the policy enforcement point. Um, then it should protect workloads from attacks from, from the outside, like uh, cross-site forgery, um, cross-site scripting, as I said, file inclusion, SQL injection, the typical ones. It should leverage wide network patches for zero-day vulnerabilities, right? Sometimes you don't, you know that there is a vulnerability, you don't know how to fix it, or even if you know how to fix it, like the, the let's say the trip from the vulnerability is fixed at the library, that library is fixed at the consumer, and that library is fixed at the consumer, and so on, until it gets your system is a long path, right? So you can just say like tomorrow is going to be fixed or tomorrow is going to be merged. Uh, and that's why with WAF you can deploy, you can patch your network basically. You can say like all the, like if you think about log for shell for example, if it was in a query parameter so you could say like okay, I will block all the requests that the query parameters follow these regex. And then you don't solve the root cause of the problem but you have time to wait for it, right? Um, it should allow to onboard legacy applications in a lift and shift fashion. Um, lift and shift fashion is basically getting your old legacy application and oh, sorry, getting your old legacy application and putting in the cloud, right? oh, in the cloud, right? Uh, no changes because probably it's a legacy application you haven't touched for years, or you don't even know how that works, or you don't even know how to build it. You don't know the language, you don't want to update anything, you don't want to rebuild. So you just move it and put it here. And then you need protection, right? Because that application maybe is vulnerable already. And it, it was just that you have internally in an internal network and, 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 and now you will put in a cloud where it's external and in server somewhere that you don't know and you could people could, could potentially grant access there. So you put a WAF in front 
and then you feel safer. You, you have, you mitigate the, the, the risks, right? Uh, and that's very popular nowadays, right? Imagine a bank moving to, to cloud, right? They, they are not rebuilding whatever COBOL they brought. Um, flexible rule set based on application internals because as we talked about before, um, we said like, okay, uh, we have the gateway that protects all these servers, but uh, some of them might be PHP, some of them might be Go, some of them might be Java, and then the gateway have to conflate all these and put security rules for everything. That's, as we said, we, it's problematic and, and it's, uh, it will probably add a lot of latency because you will have to evaluate a lot of rules. Um, if you put in different workloads you set, uh, you, you put different rule sets, then it will be much easier and, and, and much more easy to maintain and not much easy to understand and digest, right? And also provide audit logs for further analysis and improve security posture through adaptive rules, right? If you do a, if you run a, a um, anomaly analysis on, on your audit logs, you could find new rules arising, new, new attacks, right? And then you can create new um, directives that will be back to the war, to the your application firewall, and then it it will be a, a, a security measure, right? In in a like adaptive way, right? I, yeah, and as we said, like there are a lot of people doing uh, lift and shift. People in service mesh is uh, requesting for web application firewalls, PCI compliance, which is uh, the 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 standard for for the for the um, electronic payments is also requesting for a WAF. So there is a lot of opportunities for WAF in the cloud days, right? And this is why uh, w we believe that WAF also plays a role in the, in the zero in the zero trust days. And now I will briefly talk about this open source project that I work on, which is OWASP called as a WAF. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an OWAF project. Um, first of all, it's open source, so yay. It's inspired in mod security. As, uh, and you might know that mod security is going end of life in July 2024. So Corasa is a, it's a good candidate for replace because it's compatible and supports SecLang. It's also focused on WASP core rules at B4, which is the, the, like the newest version. It's gonna be released very soon. Um, it has multi-platform connectors. It, it supports native Go, of course. Caddy, we have a connector for, for hub proxy. Um, then it supports Envoy, Istio, Kong, using proxy, uh, AP6 as well. And they just released an, uh, uh, a new version supporting proxy WASM as well. Uh, proxy WASM is a standard for, for WebAssembly in proxies. And it's fully compatible with WebAssembly. That means that you could run in different platforms without uh, like this Go library uh, and this Go engine in different platforms. For example, Corasa Playground, which is a website where you can test rules, is, is running entirely in the browser because we compile it into WebAssembly and then run in the browser through WebAssembly. So that, that's also open up a world of possibilities. A uh, pluggable architecture, we have a plugins API for extending functionality. Uh, a month ago, one uh, student from Google Summer of Code brought a plugin for rate limiting in Corasa, so that was cool. And it's focused on high throughput and performance, right? Because as you might know, um, when you have the, the WAF in your gateway or in your ingress, then it will only happen once. And then performance is, of course, a concern, but I mean, it's something you could accept. But when you run on every single workflow, then uh, you, may, you need that performance is, is really um, good because then you will, have, you will add latency every time, every hop, right? So it's performance driven. It focuses on memory consumption, on CPU consumption. And it's aimed to be run in the critical path, right? Because it, it will appear in the critical path many times. Right, for example, in the in the policy enforcement point. And finally, conclusions. Well, first, zero trust is incomp incompatible with other network perimeter-based security approaches, as I said. Right, they are not. They don't hate each other. They can work together, and provide you more security. 
Um, no single component or function will be sufficient to achieve good level of security alone, but they work collectively, right, as one layer over the other to achieve uh, protection. Um, and then WAF still plays a role in the cloud days, that's for sure. If you have any question, I will be around. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Any question? I uploaded my slides to speaker deck and, and, and also the, the, the platform for, uh, for the conference, right? Question? Yeah, I, I would say it's more like a trade-off, right? When you choose to, to run a sidecar along with your, with your actual workload, let's say, um, you decided already that this is trustable, although maybe it might be compromised. Who knows? Maybe tomorrow they disclose a, a vulnerability in Envoy and, and we are done. But at that time, you, you can never trust it. It's like testing. You, you never finish testing, right? It's the same. You cannot guarantee that this is 100% sure or, or safe, but you, you make a decision that, okay, I will trust this. And then, yeah, there is no measure, security measure between your, your sidecar and your workload, that's for sure. Because otherwise, the, like the, uh, let's say the, the, the latency will be huge, right? Uh, also, because of the nature of the sidecar, um, it has a lot of access to your actual pod, right? Or to your actual workload. So yeah, you should trust, you should trust. You, you, you have no other, other choice. But that's why you call the implicit a trust zone because everything there is implicitly trustable. But it's a moral decision. Uh, I mean, nobody can guarantee this is 100% sure, safe. Hmm. Any other question? Well, well, it's all right, I couldn't. So, I mean, I guess, would you actually put the web application files into the web server you're running, the application you and then just set my rules now to actually run? Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, you could use Coraza as a library and, and, yeah. and put it in a middleware in your code. The, then there is another concept that plays, uh, that comes into play, right? You want to leverage WAF as a wide organization policy. And then the easy way is to use a sidecar, right? Because otherwise you will force, not force, but you will request that all teams will include this middleware, which for example here, uh, Coraza is written in Go. Uh, what if you don't have Go services or you have different service, multi-language service? Then I, I think that's one of the key points of having service mesh, right? That you want to uh, leverage wide organization policies for everything without uh, being intrusive about them, without requesting them to do this or that, right? They, so teams can just focus on the service itself. Uh, wait, wait a second, you had a question? Why, for the, for the sake of what you need another software, was why just is not part of the Apache or Nginx or like yet another model? Yeah, because, yeah, for example, mod security was like that, yeah? You will um, put um, mod security in Apache as a plugin, and, and that happened when Apache was the, the main orchestrator of, of, your, ser of your endpoints, let's say. Um, right now, what you have is that you have one gateway, but uh, ah, but, but then in the days of Apache, when service A communicated with, or endpoint A internally communicated with endpoint B, the communication will be direct. With zero trust, you don't want that. You want that they both are encrypted, MT, mutual TLS, for example, that the traffic um, 
is also uh, analyzed. For example, imagine that you have service A and service B, and someone gets into the po into the container of service B and start doing curl or start uh, start modifying. A, if, if it's an interpreted language, they start modifying the code to, to do certain malicious calls to service B. So you don't want, you don't want that trust. And, and at that time, the security that you put in the, in the main proxy is already gone. That, it doesn't come to play, right? That's why you will put that on every single uh, word load, let's say. That's, that's the main thing. You. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. That's that's. A, I I would say, when when you have, let's say, when you start greenfield and you decide, okay, we are using this language and whatever, then things are easier. But as soon as you move to, uh, or you have legacies, or you, it's a bigger organization, or you have high throughput, so you need to decide, okay, for this application, I use this language, for this, I use Kafka streams, for this, then everything becomes heterogeneous. And then if you don't have a, a consistent way to deliver these policies, then it's like not having policies at all. That's, that's the, the main problem. Any other question? Okay, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.